what we have seen in recent years is the rise of the in environmental movement and that it incorporates an intersectional approach to environmental issues. Um, we have seen this at the People's Climate March in New York City two years ago, and we have seen it in, at the COP in Paris uh, last year. And I think actually everybody here who is sitting here on the panel went to Paris and might say a few words later in their presentations about that experience. So the Paris Agreement uh, seems to mark a turning point in several ways. On the one hand side, having the vast majority of existing states accepting that climate change is happening and that it is man-made and that it needs to be stopped is huge, especially if you live in a country where people throw snowballs in the center to prove that global warming is not happening. And on the other hand, also, the, this agreement is missing so much. You know, regulations, thresholds, consequences, what have you. So it's also clear that it's not enough uh, of what we need. So what kind of movement do we need? And also, what kind of movement do we already have? Last Sunday evening in a field in Lusatia, southeast of Berlin in Germany, one of Germany's two big lignite uh, coal uh, digging regions where several thousand uh, younger and older activists were having a massive party to celebrate um, the successful shutdown over two days of significant parts of Germany's energy infrastructure without a lot of people getting arrested, a lot of people getting beaten, and us scoring, in fact, a massive movement building and political victory. And as we were dancing in this tent, and maybe some of you know this, this feeling of this collective high that you experience after a successful action, which is incomparable to many other highs. Um, not that I know about these, but um, <laughs> the slogan that was chanted until people couldn't chant anymore, until they were basically hoarse, um, was, we are unstoppable, another world is possible. And that, the feeling of, of power and determination um, and purpose that I felt in that tent um, was something I haven't experienced for quite a while. And, and, and actually, personally, on an affective level, I haven't experienced that since the early years of the alter globalization movement, or maybe not since that rainy Tuesday afternoon in Seattle, the 30th of, 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 of November in Seattle, 1999, when, uh, when 10,000 direct action activists shut down the WTO summit for a day. And, and in that act somehow made other worlds possible. And that tent, in, in that tent in Lusatia, for, for, for me, for the first time, certainly since 2009, since the Copenhagen summit, but probably since 1999, there was the possibility of a new global cycle of struggles that would develop similar sort of like political potency as the alter globalization movement. And of course, I'm also referring back to the Seattle moment, because that's when Naomi Klein coined in her iconic turn of phrase the notion of a movement of movements uh, uh, in that sense. And it wasn't just other worlds becoming possible, it was also the emergence of a new transnational organizational form. The movement of movements is also an adaptation, obviously, to the diversification of a left field of practice and the transnationalization of a left field of practice. You cannot imagine classical forms of unity at a in a global, diverse left field. The movement of movements is, in that sense, an organizational form appropriate to a diverse and transnational progressive movement. This is what my response would be in terms of the question of what is the movement of movements? And what movements do we need to connect together in order to address environmental justice? Not just climate change, but environmental justice and, and climate justice. Um, on the left, you have an image of the, the founder of the uh, Peggy Shepherd, one of the founders, um, at a protest uh, against the concentration of these bus depots in northern Manhattan. In the center, you have an, a, a poster that goes along with that campaign, <coughs> was issued after we act was founded many years later. And then on the far right, you have an image from last year, 2015, of Eric Garner, um, who was a gentleman that was killed by the police, NYPD, in Staten Island, as a result of um, what they would say would be broken windows policy of policing. Uh, so there's a lot of questions around what happened in that incident, but the commonality within all these images are people who can't breathe. Um, and, I, you know, so 
there's people who can't breathe due to environmental conditions, due to the infrastructure that I talked about earlier. Uh, there's people, who, and there's people who can't breathe because they have a baton around their neck. And I think it's wrong to isolate these separate movements and say one is related to the environment and one, related, one is related to police brutality. The park was built by Robert Moses, one of the most powerful people in the history of New York, and one of the most prolific builders in the history of the world, really. Um, what he managed to do was to move all of that infrastructure, so all of that infrastructure that I listed <laughs> earlier, that's located on the West Harlem waterfront, that was all originally supposed to be at 72nd Street, where Riverside Park is now. In order to get Riverside Park built, all of that infrastructure had to be relocated to 125th Street so the park could be there, right? You can't build a park. A park doesn't mesh with the sewage treatment plan, at least not any that I've seen. Um, so all of that infrastructure was moved, and that allowed Riverside Park to be built. Fast forward many decades later, and because Riverside Park is there, it becomes an attractive place to build residential development. Enter Donald Trump, one of the most prolific builders in the modern age in New York City, who built one of his largest developments in New York City at 72nd Street. So this, this development wouldn't have been allowed to have been built, or wouldn't have been possible, unless Riverside Park was there, and Riverside Park wouldn't have been there unless the infrastructure was moved to the African American community of, of West Harlem. And I, the, another reason that I bring this up is because to me it's a very clear example of how power accrues and how environmental issues can lead to the accrual of wealth, which are then used to influence the political sphere. So as a result of, you know, of course not all of Donald Trump's wealth came from this one development, but, it, but this is a very large development. A significant amount of his wealth is generated here, and that wealth has now allowed him to do what he's doing. In 2008, um, my son was born, and I think... It's hard, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to be too sentimental about it, but it, I think you can't have a child and also read and also accept the scientific consensus about climate change and the timeline that we're talking about without that being, you know, something that is on your mind really on a daily basis. Um, because we're talking about when my child is 30, when my child is 40, what is this world going to actually look like um, if current trends continue, and I don't think that that, and I think that can be underestimated, the impact that that has in terms of the education outreach that we have to do and in terms of how people are conceptualizing these questions. Um, and then I think trade unions for energy democracy, be, being a part of the work of that project, I think has been so critical uh, in, terms of a, in terms of helping us be better at doing the, the things I was talking about previously, but also... Um, the concept of energy democracy, I think, is, a, is an incredibly um, important um, uh, idea within the, this concept of building a movement of movements, and, and with a movement of movements, and, and also in the, in the context of talking about social ownership and talking about what is it that we can pose as an alternative. If we're saying these economic models and this economic incentives are what's destroying the climate, what is, our, what is our alternative economic models um, and economic uh, agenda? Um, and, and, and how does that relate to power? How does that relate to um, uh, social structures in our communities and so on and so forth? So I think the, the concept of, of energy democracy is key to that. So I think one of the things that I definitely heard um, in the presentations is about the narrative. How do we speak to our own about climate justice? Because I think that's also one of the challenges, uh, particularly for Indigenous people. We're always fighting to be heard, to be visible, to be seen in larger movements. We're always trying to uh, activate our rights and all of these other things, right, within this larger gamut of, of climate justice, right? Um, so I think that's something really important for our movement to think about. How do we talk about that to our own folks? If we really believe that climate justice, as you said, is the most critical thing moving forward, are we approaching that in a way where workers in New York City are going to be into this issue, um, are, are going to care, right? And I think you nailed it on the head in terms of, I really cared about this issue because I thought about the future. I thought about the future for my own child, right? And I think these are the moments that people have in a deep, resonating way um, that have moved them. Uh, we've done a lot of work on the tar sands issue. Personally, I run, I'm a director of a small project called the Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign. The thing that moved people was the story of the community community members, of hearing what the impacts were like, hearing about the cancer, about the devastation to the land from someone who's living it, 
right? And that moved people in a really deep way. If we can't articulate that to the masses and talk about climate justice in a real way that impacts people and moves them in their day-to-day -day lives, we're not going to win anything. So I think that's a really key, important thing. We say that capitalism and greed are the biggest challenges moving forward um, to how we want to see the world. But we're also not talking about what our vision for the future really is. And I think that's something that as an Indigenous person we're taught to be really invested in the future. We're taught that we need to make decisions for seven generations in front of us. Not just our own children and our grandchildren, but for seven generations.